is I'm not really quite, we're not really quite ready to tackle this idea of quantum mechanics. Uh, and the reason why, so we certainly will, is that the way the quantum mechanics is formulated is as a response, historically as a response to experiments, right? There's a series of important experiments that were done late 1800s, early 1900s, where people started to realize that everything that we knew up to that point, right, the electromagnetic equations from Maxwell, Newton's laws, basic, very uh, primordial chemistry, it's not even chemistry, they barely knew the atoms at this, this time, um, that the results that we get from these experiments disagree fundamentally with our classical understanding of how the universe works. We saw that with the color and the flavor of the electron. Right? And in fact, I've, I've already answered what, so I'm going to try to illustrate a couple of certain features that people have discovered at this time about how matter works that is completely different from how we used to understand it. And that, that, that flavor and color experiment that we did is one of the most, illustrates a very, very important concept that's universal to matter in this region, right? Microscopic. And that concept, I kind of mentioned it briefly. But I'm, I'm just going to kind of formalize the word a little bit. We'll see it more very soon. And so one of the things that microscopic particles or atoms or molecules show that's universal, it, uh, one of the principles that we have is what's called superposition. And I think I mentioned this term at the end of the first lecture, but I didn't really expand on it too much. Um, and we will expand on it. Next week, we're going to really look at superposition. It's a, it's a key property of, of microscopic matter, molecules and atoms. It's one of many different discoveries, different types of principles that, that underlie chemistry. And the idea is this. Remember that in our experiment, so in our experiment, we measured that when you pass your electron, say just through the color box, that you get 50% white and 50% black, well, we saw that. And that made a lot of sense, but we saw that when you mix the, the, the measurements, so when we, when we filter a color and block the other one, and we run that, that, let's say the white electrons through the flavor box, and then measure the color after the flavor, we lose all that information about the color. Remember that we, we separated the white the white electrons, we, we separate them then by color, and then we measure, I'm sorry, me separate them by flavor, and then we measure the color again, and now they're not white anymore, they're 50-50 again. Right? And, and what the conclusion is, is so, so, so that's through color, through the color box, I'll write that as C, the C box, but if we do C, and then F, for flavor, and then color again. So let's say we fi filter the whites, and then and then the sweets, and then the whites again, or then we do the color measurement of those, what we think are white and sweet, we get 50%, uh, right, we lose that information. We get 50% white and 50% black. They're no longer 100% white, right? So it's like as if the information was lost. Okay, and the only way to explain the results of this result, and we'll formalize this next week, the only way to explain this result, there's two conclusions. One is that color, in this case, color and flavor are incompatible measurements. Okay, so what that means is, is that if we define something by its color, we lose information about its flavor. And when we define something by its flavor, we lose information about its color. Right? We can only know one simultaneously. Right? So it's either, it's not both, but it's either or. Right? That's the only way to explain this. But there's another thing, and, and your homework explores this, is the question is, is what, what is the possible, imagine thinking about what the electron looks like before it ever goes through any of this, the initial state of the electron. What is it? Right? And, and it's interesting to think about because let's say we, we pass them and they become white 
We say they're sweet, and then we come back and they're 50% white and black. And you ask the question is, what was the state of the electron, the color and the flavor of the electron? Let's just say one of them, because you can't, it turns out you can't both know both at the same time. So just pick one. So let's say to just color, what was the initial color state of the electrons before it ever entered the experiment? And there's only one answer to that. And this is what your homework will show, is that initially, The electron is in all, sorry, I'm having problems writing here, all possible, this is an is, all possible colors or flavors. Okay? That's the, as you'll see in the homework, that's the only way to explain the results. That it's, and I, I want to be, be very clear about this, I'm going to write something else that kind of reiterates this in just a second. The only way to explain these results is that the original electron comes in is actually in all of the states simultaneously. It's the only way you can get these results. That not, it's not that an electron is white or black. Turns out it's not neither either. It's kind of like it's both. It's actually not even both at the same time. It's something different than that. And, and that concept is called superposition. All right, that the, that the particle exists in a sum or difference of the white and the black state simultaneously. All right, so, and what I mean by that is that if you think, so the wrong way to think about the electrons is that if you have 100 electrons, And that on average, right, this is what we would think about it in, in, in thermodynamics or chemistry, in, in, in equilibrium. We would say that if we passed 100 electrons through the color box, so we're passing, let me just write that, we're passing 100 into the color box, that's a C, not a G. The wrong way to think about this is that the, the electrons are just randomly distributed between white and black. And that the actual answer is that it's a 50% white mixture and a 50% black mixture, right? And that the mole fractions of the white and the black electrons are 0.5, right? That's what we would think about in, in chemistry, right? If we, if we pass 100 electrons through a box and 50 of them look like they're white and 50 look like they're black, well, that must mean we have equal moles of black and white electrons. Totally reasonable assumption to make, right? That's what thermodynamics and equilibrium would tell us. There's no energy difference between white electrons and black electrons. There's no preference one way or the other. So they exist at a, an equilibrium constant between white and black is one. They're equal at concentration. That gives you the wrong answer. The right way to think about it, and this is what the homework explores, is that the electron should be represented not as either 50% white or 50% black, one or the other, but the initial electron is actually either is, is represented as white plus or minus black. It's either the sum or the difference of the white state and the black state. Now the minus sign seems odd. Why would you have minus signs here? What does it mean to be mi white minus black? Um, we'll come to that. It'll make sense next week. But there should be a plus or minus sign here. So it could be plus or minus. Right? The math will work out that go for an allowed. And we'll see this kind of structure all the time. All the time. This plus or minus thing. Right? This is what's called superposition, right? We're taking two different states and we're adding them together. And, and the reason why we call it superposition is because when you add two waves together, so think about two different, two different waves of different frequencies or wavelengths, two different light sources or something like that. The physics of adding two lights together, two waves together to create a, a new light source that's the sum of the both follows the same physics. Right? The light that you see out when you mix two light beams together is the sum or the difference of the two light beams. And that concept is called superposition. Right? This is a wave-like property. Right? Water waves, light waves, work exactly the same way. Exactly the same way. Right? And, that's, and as you'll see in the homework, that's the only way to explain the results is that the state of the electron 
before it hits the first color box is that it's in all of the possible states at the same time. But what we're also going to find out is that, remember that when we, when we switch from color to flavor, we lose the color information. So what that means is that, so uh, because color and flavor are inconsistent with each other, right, they're incompatible, you have two choices. Right? You can either represent your electron as a sum of white or black, a superposition between the white or black states, or it can be represented as a superposition of sweet and savory. All right? It can't be both. All right? We have to choose. And when we change our choice, we lose information about the other. Right? That's exactly what we saw in that experiment. Right? We defined our electron as white and black first. Right? So our system is in this state initially when we make that measurement. And then we switch to sweet and savory. Those two representations are diametrically close to each other. They don't communicate. They, they're incompatible with each other. So when you're here, if you know if it's white or black, you know absolutely nothing about the sweet or savoriness of it. It could be either. So if, if my electron is white, then it's also in a superposition of sweet and savory. If it's black, it's in a superposition of sweet and savory. If it's sweet, then it's in a super, it's both white and black. If it's savory, it's both white and black, right? You can't know both at the same time, right? And this bothered people, not surprisingly, right? Because if you put a piece of chocolate through here, if you have a chocolate box that tells you whether your chocolate's sweet or savory, white and black, it's really easy to do that, right? You just need a couple undergrads to look at it and eat it and I, they can tell you 100% certainty where they fall, right? right? But electrons don't work that way. Right? And in fact, no microscopic particle works that way. They all fail that experiment. No matter how many undergrads you have how, or how many, how many classically trained chefs you have, you feed electrons in them, they can't tell you whether they're white or black, you can't sweet and savory. It never works. Right? So this is something that is absolutely true and something we have to live with. And that's one of the problems with quantum mechanics, why it's tough, is because how can an electron be both white and black at the same time? All right, we're going to try to resolve that next week and try to come up with a way to represent this. And we'll do that, but it still won't solve this problem of it being confusing, right? that it's counterintuitive. Right? There's nothing you can do about that. It's just the way it is. Okay, any questions about this? All right, we'll, see this we'll see this a lot. All right. And we're going to see that, that, that particles in general, anything, an atom, a molecule, we can always represent them as a superposition of many different states. Right? A hydrogen atom is a superposition of, if it's got one electron, a hydrogen atom, if you never look at it, is in a superposition where the electron's in the 1s orbital, in the 2s orbital, in the 2p orbital, in the 3d orbital. It's in all of them. And it's not until you measure it that you find where it's at. That has some really, really important consequences. And we're going to see that uh, pretty quickly. That kind of idea uh, permeates the entire, uh, all of science and all of chemistry. OK, so what I want to talk about, so that's superposition. That's one of the key principles of quantum mechanics. I want to talk about uh, probably two more today with some experimental backgrounds or some history. And the first one I want to talk about is one that you're actually very familiar with. Particles are quantized. What does this mean? Well, what it means is, is this, is that imagine that your particle, all right, so let's imagine we have an electron, all right, and we want to accelerate it. Let's say we want to put it in a box. All right, we're going to put it in a box. In fact, we're going to study this very soon. We're going to put it in a box um, with infinitely high walls. All right, so once it's in the box, it can't escape. Okay? All right, so the electron's trapped inside of this box that it can't escape. And the question I want to ask is, 
So, but I can still manipulate the electron inside of this box, right? I can reach in and I can apply energy to it. I can excite it. I can warm it up. I can cool it down and so on. Okay? And the question I have is what does, what are the possible kinetic energies? Right, how, that, right, that's mv squared, right, the velocities, effectively. What are the possible kinetic energies or velocities this electron can have in the box? All right, so let's imagine it's a ball, all right, just a regular old baseball or something like that, or basketball, right? You put the, you put the ball in this box, and you push it around, right? You give it a shove, and it starts moving at some velocity, some kinetic energy. And you shove it a little harder, and it starts moving around. It moves a little faster. You shove it even harder, it moves even faster. But you can shove it at any energy you want. You can append any amount of energy to that ball, and it will respond in time, right? By Newton's third law, right? Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. I push the ball with energy of one joule, then the ball now has one joule of kinetic energy. If I give it 1.3333256 joules, then the ball also has 1.3333256 I can give it any energy I want. Right, so classically, for a classical particle, so for a ball, any energy is OK. OK, now what happens when I put an electron in this box? What you find is that the electron only has specific energies that it's allowed to, to move at. So for instance, let's say the, the electron can move at one joule. All right, you see it moving at one joule. And then you say, OK, let me put a little bit more energy into it, 1.5 joules. And it doesn't do anything. And then you can give it two joules. And then it moves a little bit more. And you try three joules, it doesn't change. But then when you put four joules, it gets excited. Right? It only takes specific energies. It only allows. It can only move at specific energies. And when we do the analysis of this problem, we'll solve this equation exactly for its energies. What you find is that the energies of the electron are a function of an integer n, right? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And it's proportional um, to the length of the box is L, just FYI. It's proportional, roughly, to n over L squared. So what that means is, so let's say, let's say L is 1, okay, just to make it easy. That means the only energies that the electron can be at are at 1 joule, 4 joules, 9 joules, 16 joules, and so on. Right? There's a specific set of energy levels that the electron can exist at. Now, if you think about the hydrogen atom, you've already seen this before. Hydrogen atom, we call those energy levels orbitals. You have the 1s shell. You have the 2s, you have the 2p, the 3s, the 4s. Those are those ends, those, those fours, those threes, those twos, those are the ends we're talking about here. Now in the hydrogen atom, the energy level structure is a little different than this, than a box. But it's the same principle. That the energies can only be what we call quantized, right? They can only be like integer frequencies, right? They can be they can have zero energy, you can have one unit of energy, you can have two units of energy, three units of energy, but it can't have 2.5 or 1.2, right? We call this quantization, right? It means that the energy levels can be indexed by integers. There's the first level, here's the second level, here's the third level. So it's not a continuous distribution of energy like a bowling ball, but a quantized set of energy levels, right? So energy is quantized in a quantum mechanical system. All right, and there's a really, really great, so the question is, is how was this discovered? Well, just from like hydrogen, all right? So the way that this quantization was discovered was um, people in the late 18th century, 19th century, they started making better and better prisms, or what are called diffraction gratings, 
right? You know what a prism does is you take white light into a prism, it splits all the colors out, right? So red goes this way, blue goes this way, you can split the spectrum out, right? So you can look at the whole color spectrum instead of just white light. So people in the 19th century started making better and better, we call it a, a prism, I guess the best way to think about it, these, they're, they're called diffraction gradients officially, but you take light from say the sun and you put it through a prism and split the, the light out so you can analyze the different colors of the light from the sun. Right? And they did that in the 1800s. They did that all the time and they did it to, it was a really, really common example and, and there's a really great story about this. If, so uh, the women, so Harvard was really, really big into this um, and as well as the University of Leiden in, in, in New England, in Netherlands. And there's these old white guys, astronomers that, that are all named after all of these things, but people who actually did all the work are the women. They collected all these women, hundreds of women over decades, collected photographic prints and worked with telescopes and analyzed all the data um, and, and discovered all of this stuff about, about a solar radiation that I'm just about to show you. Very, very hard, meticulous, difficult work. Astronomy, back in the old days before computers, very, very meticulous work. It was done by women, and none of those women ever got any credit for it until after they were far dead. Right? That's a very common story in science, but um, it's a very, very famous story in, in astronomy. And many of the discoveries about solar radiation were made by women and were never uh, properly attributed. So of course this is what you see. Now what I'm showing here, you've probably seen before, but instead, instead of thinking about the sun, I'll show you a picture of the sun spectrum in a second. Right? What we're going to do here is we're going to make a, a tube of gas, right, whether oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, or sodium, and either excite it with electrons or excite it with electricity to, to, so it emits light, right, like a neon light, or we shine light through it and see where it absorbs. And what they see, again, just like I'm sure you guys have seen a million times before, that each atom, each molecule, or each atom that you pick for each molecule in the case of nitrogen and oxygen, absorbs radiation or emits radiation at very, very specific wavelengths. Right? So if I, if I shine my prism, if I shine some white light through my sample of oxygen and then, and then apply a prism to split it out, you're going to see there's giant gaps in my absorption spectrum. Right? And these are, of course, associated with, as I'm, I'm sure you guys know, the electron in, the, in, in a certain orbital being excited to another one. Yeah. Right? So it was a big surprise that when, when people realized, so for instance, the astronomers, they were taking spectra, they were taking the light from the sun and splitting it out with the fraction gradient, looking at the spectrum of the sun. And of course, they think, okay, well, the sun's a white light source. It has all of these frequencies of light, right? It should look like a rainbow. But then when they pull it out and they look, they see all of these gaps. Right? Well, of course, nowadays we, we think of this, we know this as spectroscopy. But at the time, no one had any idea why these things were moving. But it was reproducible. That's the important thing. Is that every, man, every European, every American that put hydrogen in, an, in, a, in a discharge cell or in an absorption experiment saw the same lines disappear. Depending on the temperature, some lines would be more intense than others. They, the intensities would change. But the positions of where the lines were never changed. It was constant. It doesn't matter if it was a domestic, you know, a sample that you created yourself or you looked at the sun or a star or anything. Right? You would see the same lines. No one understood why the hell this was. They didn't understand the structure. They just knew that each atom had its own unique set of atomic lines. These lines, these absorption lines, these gaps in the spectrum. And I'll just focus on hydrogen in particular. So this is the hydrogen visible spectrum. Um, there are these different bands, are, we'll look at this in more detail with hydrogen, but there's these different bands named after the scientists who discovered them. And the ones I want to focus on in particular, or just to mention, are these first two bands on the left. This is called the Lyman band. And this is the Balmer band named after their discoverers. And Balmer, when he discovered the Balmer lines in 1885, these black lines here, he looked at them and said, oh, they've got this interesting pattern. Right? And so he does complete numerology. And he comes up with this formula that the wavelengths of these lines in angstroms can be equal to 3646 times 1 over 1 minus 4 over n squared. Right? He comes up with this formula that fits these black lines perfectly. Right? He's got no idea what the physics are. He just knows that there's some pattern to them. Right? This is literally no more, this is like uh, the equivalent of astrology 
but it is an early example of spectroscopy, right? You're fitting a pattern of lines to some model that fits the, the pattern exactly. And that's got to be meaningful, right? There's not, it's probably not, it's not a coincidence that these lines fit to that because you can assign a different formula for the Lyman lines. And then if you go to sodium or neon or helium, there's a different pattern. And you can assign a new, a, a new uh, what do you call it, a new formula for them. But all the formulas are different, OK? So the formula that, that you come up with, the Lyman has a different structure than you do for the Bowman. This is the passion, and I forget the other ones. Um, and, but that's interesting. So they all have a similar kind of structure. They all look a little different from atom to atom, or band of line to band of line. But they all fit a function. That's a function of an integer, right? N here is 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and so on, right? This, they're quantized, just like I said before. All right, and so people thought about this for a long time. And as more data grew, near the end of the, cent the 19th century, or early 19th, 20th century, uh, uh, a man named Rydberg comes up with this lovely formula. He says he could fit the entire hydrogen spectrum to one, one's parameter, one spectrum, or one formula. And it's this constant R, which is called the Rydberg constant. We'll come back to that, that constant later when we talk about hydrogen, that value. But it's got a specific value. And it's a function of two different integers. Right? So it could be n1 and n2 or two different numbers. It could be n2 is greater than n1. So it could be like 2 and 1, 3 and 2, and so on and so forth. And depending on which integers you find and apply this, you get these series of lines. Right? So what they, and then they go to the other atom. They go to helium neon and so on, you know, the other sodium. And there's a new formula that also describes the spectrum. But that formula doesn't describe any of the other atoms. Right? This formula only works for hydrogen. You need a new formula for helium. You need a new formula for sodium and so on. Okay, but each one could be fit to something. Right? And, and so, not surprisingly, people thought that there must be something deeper going on here. Right? How can it be that all of these atoms all have the same behavior. Right? They show the exact same thing, but you just have to do a different statistical fit on the data to get a new model, but the same concept applies, right? You see the same kinds of patterns, no matter the atom, right? But the patterns change based on the atom. So that, that indicated that there must be something, some sort of like unified model that explains the emission of all atoms, right? Kind of like a universal function that defines how atoms emit radiation. Okay? Not surprisingly, there is that formula. And that's what we're, one of the reasons, the things we're learning this semester is how do we get to that point? Right? There is a unified theory for that. Right? That's quantum mechanics. But at this time, no one had any idea about this. They barely even knew atoms existed at this point. Right? Um, but we will find that all of this is correct. Rickberg was right. It does, the hydrogen atom does follow this formula, and you can derive it from first principles. He got the right answer, but for the wrong reasons. Right? For the wrong reasons. Right? Rippert didn't believe any of this quantum mechanics junk. He thought it was all garbage. Right? He, he was an old timer. I don't know what you call an 18th century boomer, but Rydberg was one of them. Um, and so this is, this is what I mean by quantization. right? And we see this property over and over and over again. And, and this is just energy, right? This is, remember, uh, light, light, as we'll see, is just an, a function of energy, right? These are energies associated with differences in energies. Um, and there are, so these are quantization of energy levels, as we'll discover. But other things are quantized in chemistry as well, or in physics, or in, in atoms and molecules. Right? We'll see that everything, all physics, the vibrations of bonds, the rotations of molecules, right? The, the motion of electrons inside of atoms, which is what this is, right? They all have their own theories, and the and the levels that the allowed, say, for rotation, the allowed angular momentum, how fast the molecule can spin, is also quantized. So you can have one unit of angular momentum for your molecule, or two, but you can't have 1.5 or 2.5. Right? Everything is quantized. So we've got two, two big principles of quantum mechanics. One that we have superposition, right, that particles can, can exist in multiple, have exist in a combination of all possible properties until you observe it. 
we'll have to think about why does that disappear when we measure it and we only measure one, right? Because if an electron that's white and black both at the same time comes in, we either see it as white or black, right? So something has to happen there. Right? You don't just see it as something that's both white and black. You only see it as one or the other. Right? So there's this concept of superposition and this concept of quantization, right? And actually, they're very interrelated as well, as we'll see. But it's important to kind of keep them separate for now. All right, so these are properties that we see for everything. Right? Atoms, molecules, electrons, and so on. Okay. It gets more interesting, though. So another really interesting experiment. Mm, what time is it? Okay. Another interesting experiment I want, I want to look at, and this one I find very, very interesting. This happened around the same time. What I want to talk about is something called a black body. And around the 1800s, people were really interested in this idea. It's the idea of an object, right? Well, something that yeah, I'm sure you guys know, that if you heat something up high enough, it starts to glow, right? Your, uh, the coils in your oven glow when they get hot enough, right? If you get a gas hot enough and turn into a flame, obviously it grow, glows, right? It turns out, so like if you think about a piece of metal, Right? And you heat it up. Right? When it's cold, you don't, it doesn't emit any light as far as you can tell. But if you get it up to a certain temperature, it starts to emit visible radiation. Right? It starts to glow red. And then it gets hotter and starts to glow blue. And then eventually it stops glowing. You don't start to see the light anymore. Right? And so what, what does that mean? Well, that means that there has to be some sort of the material must be emitting light. And that light, the light that it emits must be a function of temperature. So, so the concept of a black body is, is kind of the, the, the idealized version of this. And a black body satisfies a couple of properties. First, it's at, it's, um, at, a, at a fixed temperature. Okay, so we chick pick a temperature. Um, it does not reflect, and so it absorbs 100% of all incoming radiation. And it also re-emits all energy as light. Okay? So it's an object that does, does not reflect. All right? It's not reflective. You think of it as a, literally a black object. It, it, every Every incident light field or heat or anything, it's 100% absorbed by it, absorbed, okay? And the only way that it can dispel energy, right, to remove energy from the system is to emit light, okay? So it's a very, very simplified, uh, simplified oven coil, if you will. Oven coils have some reflectivity and also they don't emit all of their energy as light, they only emit some of it. So this is like a perfect coil. All right, here's a nice, here's a nice example of, of kind of a, a black body experiment. You have this cavity, right, this big circular hollow object um, that's kept at a constant temperature. Let's say it's made out of metal, okay, and, and nothing can come out of it, okay? So it's completely black on the outside, right? It has no emission properties, except for this small little region right here. So if there's any light that gets emitted from the walls, the hot walls, that light, if it ever bounces through, the only way it can escape is through this viewing hole. Okay, so what we're going to do is this. We're going to measure, we're going to take this light right here as a function, we're going to change the temperature as we do it, of course. We're going to do different temperatures and check it. And we're going to take this light and put it through a prism, all right? And then think about what, what is the intensity of the light as a function of its wavelength. All right, so what I want to measure from here, I'm going to scroll over to the next slide, and I'll move this over just a sec. So what I want to do is I want to set temperature, so set T, and then I want to take the light and take emitted light pass through a prism or a diffraction grating. And I want to measure 
the intensity of the light or the power of the light as a function of the wavelength. So intensity as a function of wavelength. Seems like a reasonable thing to do, right? Maybe we're curious if maybe these objects emit more red light than blue light or something. Seems like a reasonable thing to do. All right, and so and so at the point at the point at when these experiments were being done, people because of Maxwell's equation, because electromagnetic theory had already been determined, people had an idea of how this should work. All right? They had the equations to solve this problem. And what they come up with, let me put this down here on the bottom of the page, is a law. Okay, It's called the Rayleigh-Jeans law. Let me make my pen a little smaller. And the, Ray, the Rayleigh Jeans Law says that the, um, what, what is the frequency? So the, the, the energy as a, okay, so I'm, I'm going to call this the energy density, which is rho. This has, I'll give you the units in a second, as a function of lambda, the wavelength, and t. Um, the units of this are watts per meter squared. So it's the intensity of the light shined on a small region, right, a small surface area. So think about a spot. Right? You have a, your light is shining on a spot, and you're asking, what's the intensity of that frequency or the wavelength of light at that spot? Okay? So it's a function of the size of the spot. Um, and let me change a few things here. So instead, um, so let me instead of wavelength, I'm sorry, I have my formulas in terms of frequency. So I'm just going to write this on the side. Wavelength is equal to the speed of light, which is c divided by the frequency of the light. Remember, the frequency of a wave is how fast you go from from across a period, right? So the higher the the higher the frequency, the smaller the wavelength. Right, so they're inversely related to each other. This is the frequency. We'll come back to frequency very soon. We'll talk a lot about frequency. All right, it's two different ways to measure a light, light field. Right? You can either measure the wavelength, which is how long the distance between two periods is, how long the period is, or the frequency is how fast does it go for, through a period of the wave. And the intensity of what the Rayleigh Jeans says is that the intensity or rather, sorry, yeah, is equal to 8 pi RT, where R is the gas constant, over C squared times the frequency squared. Okay, so what, the, what does this say? It says that the, if you have a black body at temperature T, that the intensity of the light at a given frequency is proportional to some constants in temperature times the frequency squared. Okay, so the, what that what does that mean? Well, that means that as frequency increases, the intensity of the light gets stronger and stronger and stronger. So now the question is, what's the total energy of the light that comes out? Right? What's the total energy? Total light energy. Well, that's the integral of this intensity integrated over all the frequencies. Right? And so what am I doing when I integrate this function? Well, I'm integrating a bunch of constants times v squared. Right? So this integral ends up being something that looks like the integral from 0 to infinity of v squared dv. This diverges, right? The integral of v squared is infinity, right? V squared doesn't converge, right? So the integral of v squared is v three v cubed over three, and v cubed evaluated infinity is infinity, right? So what does that say? Well, it says that classically, 
that any object, any black body, so the conclusion is, and I'll write this here in a box, any black body at any temperature, so let's say any positive temperature, at t greater than 0 has infinite energy, infinite energy. All right, so what does that mean? Well, that means that if you're at any temperature at all, like you guys, humans can be represented fairly well as black bodies, that if you're at a temperature, you glow white hot constantly, any temperature you want. In fact, that's what this applies. Anything that has a temperature glows white hot, right? Because the intensity of the, of the, of the light increases as frequency squared. So as you go from the infrared to the optical to the UV to the X-ray, Right, that frequency is increasing, the wavelength is decreasing, however you think about it. And the, and the intensity of the light increases. And so that would mean that if you're you know, at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, then you're going to glow white hot. Right? That's what classical physics predicts. Well, that's a problem because we obviously don't glow white hot. Right? The universe would not exist. It would just be a giant soup of infinitely hot photons infinitely hot light, it would just be this giant white ball of energy at infinite energy, and that's obviously not true. Okay, so that was a real problem. And, and what they find, oh, actually I have a really nice feature here I want to use, just a sec. This has a coordinate system built into it, ooh, look at that. So if I were to plot frequency, which has units of per second, versus the intensity of the light at that frequency at a given temperature, and I do it experimentally, what do I see? Let me draw it in a different color. So if I plot the spectrum out of experiment, what I see is that it, it's not infinite. It's a closed curve. It looks kind of like this. So let's let this be t equals t1. All right. So there's a peak to the intense. There's a peak to there's a light. There's a frequency where the light is most intense and then around it it gets it's less intense. Okay. And as you start to increase the temperature where T1 is great, less than T2, the peak of the, of, the, of the light starts to shift towards the blue, right? The higher frequencies are lower wavelengths, right? And that makes sense, right? Because as you start to heat your oven up, your little oven coil up, you get to a certain temperature, it starts to glow red, right? So you know that the frequencies of the light are starting to increase as you heat up, because you start in the infrared, you can't see the infrared, and now you're starting to see red, right? Which is the longest wavelength of the rainbow. And then it starts to become more white and green and yellow and, and blue and so on and so forth. Right, but classical theory, what classical theory predicts, so what does the Rayleigh Jeans Law predict? Well, the Rayleigh Jeans Law says that low, it predicts at low energy. It's pretty consistent. And then what it does, oops, sorry, I didn't mean that to become a line. It diverges like this. This is the Rayleigh Jeans Law. So the rayleigh Jeans law, it turns out, works at low energy, or low frequencies, long wavelengths. And it agrees really well, but as you start to get near the, what we call the ultraviolet limit, right, the blue limit, the high frequency limit, it diverges. All right? And that's why I said that the, the classically, we would think that everything is glowing white hot if it has a temperature. But we see that the actual result is, gives us a nice closed curve that increases and then decreases, like we see. My experiment is, it shows obviously that we are going white hot. And there's a term for this disagreement. And it's a very, very dramatic term, but I love it. It's called the ultraviolet catastrophe. I forget who named it this, but it is a, it is a word that's been used, a term that was used historically to describe this disagreement between theory and, and, and classical physics about black bodies, and it's called the ultraviolet catastrophe. Ultraviolet means long, uh, high frequencies or low wavelengths, right? So it diverges at long, at high energies. Right? Ultraviolet catastrophe. Right? Not surprisingly, there turns out to be something in, in 
later in, in physics called the infrared catastrophe. There are problems at the low end later too, but um, it's, a, it's kind of a tongue-in-cheek, kind of a tongue-in-cheek name. And so around, the, around 1880, 1870, people were trying to think about, well, how do we fix this problem? Right? What are we missing? And, and a man named Max Planck, a German physicist named Max Planck, has a really, really interesting idea. Oh, by the way, so I just wanted to show you really quickly, just to convince you. And I'll show you some other pictures in a second. This is the spectrum of the sun. And the sun fits a beautiful black dot body curve at a temperature of 5250 Celsius. Okay, so this is actually the emission of the sun, this, this, this um, yellow curve right here. You can see there's some gaps in it. Again, that's because of the atoms absorbing radiation. And this, 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 this is actually the uh, atmospheric transmission curve. So this is where water and oxygen and CO2 would absorb radiation. And so this is actually, the red is actually what we observe in our atmosphere. And then when we go outside of our atmosphere, we see this, this, this yellow spectrum. Right? But it looks, it has this really nice, this really nice sort of curve here. We call it black body spectrum. And it, and, you could, and it fits beautifully. Okay. And the question is, is well, how, what, what are we missing theoretically? What are we missing in our, our theory, right? In our understanding about how the world, the universe works, where we don't, where, again, what would Rayleigh genes tell us? Rayleigh genes would tell us classically that it would go like this, right? Obviously, it doesn't do that. Okay, so Max Planck has a really, really genius idea. The big distinction between classical physics and the true nature of reality is that the assumption that the classical physicists made was that whatever objects are in this black body, right, these little atoms that are vibrating and emitting light, whatever they are, that they can emit radiation at any frequency or any wavelength at any intensity they want. Right? So you can have an emitter at 1,500 nanometers, it can emit basically any energy at once. Okay, it can emit one watt, it can one, emit 1.1 watts, 1.2 watts, 1.3 watts, it can emit anything at once, right? It's completely, these, each of these little objects in our black body can emit whatever radiation at any intensity they want. All right, and Max Planck says, well, let's try something different. So what Max Planck says, let me open a new page here. So Planck says, our black body emitters can only emit quantized amounts of light energy. Now what do I mean by that? Okay, so let's think I have my black body, I have on, on my walls, I have little atoms that are, you know, we think of them as atoms now, that are emitting little light particles, right? They're emitting light. Each one is emitting a, little, a photon or some light wave. And what he says is that the energy of these emissions, so the energy of a black body, can't be any particular value, but it has to be an integer number n. This is an integer. So 0, 1, 2, blah, 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 times some proportionality constant h. So this is a constant. Times the frequency of the light that it emits. OK? So what that means is that if your, your black body wants to emit, let's say, red light, 600 nanometers, or whatever the equivalent of frequency is for that. Right? It can only emit units of one, or two, or three, or four. It can't emit 3.5 units of energy at red. It can only emit one, or two, or three, or four, or five, or 10 to the 20. But it can't do in between. It can't do any real number of entities, right? It can only take integer or quantized amounts of light. And so what Planck 
So Planck takes this assumption. Now, the funny thing is he doesn't believe it. He just makes this assumption, all right? He does not believe it. He's right, by the way, but uh, he doesn't believe it because, once again, he doesn't believe quantum mechanics. And he comes up with a new equation. And his equation that he comes up with is called Planck's, Planck's Law. And he says that the intensity of light at a given frequency, sorry, let me erase that and make it cleaner. I apologize. So it's the same formula, same thing we were talking about before, the intensity of a light on a spot at a given frequency. So the density of the energy or the intensity at a function, as a, which is a function of temperature and frequency is 8 pi times this constant h over c cubed times v cubed over e to the h v over r t, gas constant, minus 1. All right, looks very different. So remember in the rayleigh genes law, the intensity is proportional to v squared. In this equation, the intensity is proportional to v cubed, but there's also this e to the v as well that, that, that modulates it, right? So as v gets bigger, v gets bigger, the, the, the numerator is getting larger, but so is the denominator. And the denominator gets much larger faster because it's an exponential, right? The exponential will end up beating out the v cubed. All right, so when you integrate this, Right, so the total energy is the integral of this. From zero to infinity, PTV, dV. This is convergent. It's not infinite. It's a number. It's a finite number. All right. And so Planck takes this theory and then says, OK, let's go look at a black body spectrum and, and fit it to this, this model. All right? And so he does that, and it fits perfectly. Perfectly. He gets all of the right behavior. Let me go back to my plot from before. Right? If you plot Planck's equation at 5250 Celsius for your temperature and convert this from wavelength to frequency, you get the exact same result. All right, he fits this, the solar spectrum, solar black body emission spectrum perfectly. All right, and so the idea is the big conclusion that Planck has is that the that light energy is emitted in what we call discrete packets. Right, that that light is not emitted kind of continuously at any energy you want, but it only comes out in little packets. There's one light energy particle at that frequency, or two, or three, or four, or five. Right? Energy, the photon, or light, is quantized. Right? This is quantization. But instead of quantizing energy levels, here we're quantizing particles, or what we think are particles. We're quantizing light, that light comes out in discrete packets. Right? What do we know? We know those, what those are called now. They're called photons. Right? Light it's often considered a wave, but it can also be considered a particle. And this is the first instance where someone says, oh, what if we treat light as a particle instead of a wave? What happens? Right? Because that's what Rayleigh and Jeans did. They treated it as a wave, and that failed miserably. Right? They say that the energy diverges. But if you treat the, if you treat the, the, the light as a particle, and at the, there are only an integer number of light particles, then you get the right answer. That means light must act as a particle as well. Planck didn't believe this. Planck went to his deathbed thinking that this was complete hokum, and he was convinced he was wrong, that he's missing something key. He wasn't. He was exactly right. And I'm going to show you how right it is. I'm going to tell you an interesting story that's unfortunately not that relevant to chemistry, but I think it's one of the best stories in 20th century physics. There was a group, uh, two astronomers. Um, I don't remember where they were from. But um, in the 1960s, 
Um, Bell, the Bell, you know, at, at, I don't know if you guys know this, but in the, at, up until the late 1970s, uh, the telephone industry in America was a monopoly owned by Bell. Right? Bell, every, all phones were controlled by Bell. There was no Verizon, no at and right? Those were the remnants of Bell. Bell was split up in the late 70s by, by the federal government for being a monopoly. Um, so Bell had more money than God, and they spent a lot of their money while controlling the telephone industry, but also for research. And because they were the only ones doing telecommunication, they were the only ones doing telecommunication research. So in the 60s, they were already thinking about satellite communications and cell phones and things like that, and they were testing out wireless satellite communication for cell phones. And so one of the options they said, well, how do we communicate, how do we transmit cell phone signals, bounce them off a satellite to somewhere else? So in New Jersey, outside the Bell Labs, Bell Labs were always in the suburbs of New Jersey, um, they built up on this hill a big, uh, what they call a horn antenna. It's a giant transmission antenna. I'll have a picture of it in the next slide. Um, to, to practice, right, to, to, as a prototype for cell phone communication. And they weren't using it at the time because at the time they, had, they didn't have any tele, they, they, they built this giant antenna, horn antenna. It's like a giant megaphone for microwaves and radio waves. Um, they didn't have any satellites. They, they, were, they hadn't even built satellites yet. So, so there wasn't really anything to do with it at the time. So they, they, read, they gave it to some astronomers. Astronomers wanted to use it to do, uh, about five years before that or so, people had first made first discovery of molecules in space. They, they found absorption lines for a couple of different small molecules in space. And um, the, these two astronomers wanted to use this big horn antenna that Bell had built to go do these observations. They wanted to do some, some astronomical observations. So they go to this telescope. Here, I'll, I'll show you the picture of it now. Ignore this picture on the right for a second. That's the punchline of this story. So here it is. You can go see it. It's in uh, Home, Homedale Township, New Jersey. I don't know where that is. Maybe someone does. Um, and this is up there, this is that big horn antenna, so there's a, they sit here, they can tune their, 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 their frequency, and this big thing collects radio waves and, and detects it. And so they turn this thing on, and, and they're going to do a very, very sensitive measurement. So they want to get rid of all the noise, all the interference they possibly can in the instrument. So they go through with a fine-tooth comb, they turn the thing on, and no matter where they point it, where they point it, when they point it, daytime, nighttime, whatever direction you want, there's this hiss, this noise, this ever-present noise. No matter where they point it, they change the frequency of it slightly, and the, the intensity of the noise changes, but it seems like it's coming from everywhere all the time, all at once. All right, and so that freaks them out, because the moment you hear, the first thing you think of, okay, I have noise that happens independent of, of, of space. There must be a problem with the instrument. And so they spent weeks looking for things. They thought they first found a bird nest in the solid state electronics. And they, they, um, they ended up, I think they ended up killing the birds, unfortunately. But they cleaned the bird nest out. They redid all the electronics. They were confident that it was going to work. All the noise was gone. They were going to fix it. They turned it back on. That hiss is still there. 360 degrees around. Nighttime, daytime, doesn't matter. Same hiss. It turned out there were a couple of other astronomy groups that had also noticed that hiss. And then when the NASA started thinking about wireless communication for the Apollo astronauts, they discovered the same hiss. No matter how good their receivers were, their transmission towers were to communicate with people at the moon, there was always this hiss. They can't get rid of this noise. And it turns out that they find out in the 60s and early 70s that there's a reason why this, this hiss isn't instrumental. This hiss exists universally. And what they discover is that this hiss is the black body nature of the universe. The universe itself is a black body. And you can measure its black body spectrum. Here's a picture of it on the left. And if you notice, this is an actual data. It's very, very well known. These error bars 
So these are, you see the error bars on this measurement. Look at the error. These are 400 times the standard deviation of the measurement. You can barely see them, right? This is a very, very precise measurement. 400 sigma. Right? You typically represent what well, plus or minus sigma. These are plus or minus 400 sigma. And they see this black body spectrum isotropic. Everywhere you point the telescope in space, you see this in the background. There's this emiss of source, right? And if you look at where this is emitting, well, first of all, the temperature is very cold, 2.7 Kelvin, right? So this, the universe is a very, very cold black body, but it's a black body. And the peak of the emission is around 5 centimeters, right? This is in the radio. It's actually in the microwave. It's around uh, 10 wave numbers. It's about 300, 280 gigahertz, right? But they picked it up. Uh, they're actually detecting over here, right? They're actually looking at the hiss on this side of it, the quiet part of it. But uh, people did higher and higher frequency measurements of it, and they mapped this out. And what you find is that if you peer all the way to the edge of the universe, okay, you can kind of think from our perspective that the universe is like a big sphere that's constantly growing. And so there's this boundary um, at the edge of the sphere. Imagine we're in the middle of the sphere, which is a bad way to think about it, but we'll think about it that way. And there's this giant sphere that has a radius of like 16 billion light years. And the sphere has this boundary. And you can't see past the boundary. Right? And that boundary has a temperature of 2.7 Kelvin. And it's a black body. It's just emitting light. It turns out that this, this light, this residual energy, are the photons uh, that are left over from the Big Bang. Right? So this is the, literally the, the black body surface, this boundary of the, of the universe is the photons and the light being emitted from the first moments of the universe. And the reason why they're so cold um, is due to very complicated reasons that I won't go into. But uh, the, longer, the, longer, the longer the distance something is away from you, they, they get what they call redshifted because the universe is expanding. That makes light go to, if, you, if a photon's emitted at a frequency, the longer it travels and then you observe it at the end, it, it looks at it like a longer wavelength than it actually is. And so all of these, these photons from the beginning of the universe have been stretched out so far that they represent a black body at 2.7 Kelvin. Right? If at the moment that the, black, that the Big Bang happened, this exact mass of photons had a, a temperature of you know, trillions and trillions and trillions of Kelvin. But over tens of billions of years, the, due to the expansion of the universe, they've, they've cooled effectively at 2.7 Kelvin. And so people have studied this universe. This is called, I'll give you the name of this. There's a very specific name for this phenomenon, and it's called the cosmic microwave background. Okay, and it's ever present in every direction. And people, people do, for years, have, have, have looked at it very, very carefully with telescopes and satellites and stuff like that. And they point, they measure this black body at all points, and right, you can point it at different spots in the, in the sky and measure this, right? And they see the same thing everywhere. It's isotropic, right? You see the same spectrum no matter which way you point. And the precision that we thought, we thought it was isotropic, right? The idea is, is that the universe on average is just, and, and on average looks exactly the same in all directions. Probably a reasonable thing to think. Right? And, and, that, and what the black body radiation shows is that up to a one part in one million, that's true. Right? So up until the 1990s, people were more or less convinced, or the, 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 the experiment suggested that the universe is isotropic, right? that, the, that the, 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 the temperature and the density of the universe is the same in all directions. That's why you get the same curve in all points, no matter where you look. But they built new telescopes to look even more precisely, right? They got past that one part in a million precision. Um, and what you find is amazing. So it turns out that this, the universe is a black body up to a part in a million, but if you look deeper than that, it's not. And here's a picture of the most recent cosmic microwave background measurement, which is no longer here. That's disappointing. So let me go ahead and put it on the screen for you. I'll find it eventually. That's not it. Sorry. <coughs> I 
Well, shit. All right, just a second. I'll pull it up for you. So there, there is a telescope that went up in around 2015 that measured this in very high precision. It's called the Planck. Not surprisingly, it's called after, named after Max Planck for the black body discovery. And here is a picture of the black body spectrum of the universe. So this is the, think of the, oh, I, sorry, it's on the wrong screen. I apologize. This is the last thing I want to show you. So this is a picture of basically the entire sky. It's been put into a, a, like a, a projection, like, like a globe projection. Right? So this is all directions in the sky. And the colors show deviations cold or warm relative to the black body. Right? So there are pockets of the universe that are cold. Right? Look at this. Right? There's this huge region that's really cold. And then there are these pockets that are really, really hot. Right? And, and so that, this already tells you that the universe wasn't created isotropically because there are cold regions. Right? This is the earliest light in the universe. Right? This is the earliest point. This is the earliest we literally can peer into the universe. All right? This is the, the furthest away object you can see. And you can see that there are regions, even at the early Big Bang, that are really, really, that are cold relative to other regions. And the really cool thing about this is, is that if you now correlate from your perspective on Earth the hot regions to the galaxies and the things that are in the way, the hot regions correlate to regions that have a lot of mass and a lot of galaxies and a lot of stars. And these cold regions don't. So these are what are called voids. These are regions of the universe that have no stars, no galaxies, nothing. They're just empty space. And then there are these pockets spattered around where there are tons of galaxies and tons of stars and, 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 and tons of, of mass. And so the answer to why the universe shows an isotropic potential Right, that it, it looks like a block body in all directions, but in fact, it's actually a, a very, very complex map of this radiation has very, very deep implications for how the universe was created. Okay. I won't go into what those are. Um, it's not an astronomy class. But this is the important po point of the black body. If, if classical physics were right, the black body would just be a giant white mass of, right? It would just be a giant white source of light. It would just be infinitely bright, right? Of course, there would be nothing in the universe besides hot matter and light if the Rayleigh Gene's law was correct, if the ultraviolet catastrophe was real. But what actually happens is that the world, the universe is basically a black body. But if you peer deep enough, you see weird things start to happen that you can't explain. Like, this is quantum mechanics at its most pure. Right? In some ways, this is even deeper than quantum, right? Because you need this idea of quantization to get to a black body spectrum. But then there's this other step that causes this diversity in a system. So there must be something going on that's more fundamental than just quantized particles, because even the presence of quantized particles would assume that this map would be completely flat. It would just be boring, in one color. So there has to be something else going on in the universe, besides what we just understand about quantization and superposition and all of this stuff we're going to be talking about that causes the black body nature of the universe, or, or us, or anything, to have these weird fluctuations. Okay? And this is, this is the cutting edge of, of well, how we understand the universe as it is right now. I don't have an answer for why this is. Um, there are some theories. But this is, what it, this is what it looks like when you peer, not into the smallest parts, but the furthest parts. Really not that much different. And you see all these interesting things. So we're going to explore this kind of concept, right? That the, the, the universe has these little hidden secrets that you don't see unless you look close enough. Okay, and we're going to start tackling that on Monday. Okay, have a good weekend.